Welcome to How to Rock the Stage Show, a show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back to Rock the Stage Show, now streaming on PPN. We are so excited to be on the new platform, expanding and pushing out further and further. Thank you for joining us both on our YouTube channel or on the PPN network. Rich Bontrager back at Sunday night, 7 o'clock, and we're ready to go for another great episode of Rock the Stage Show. Let me ask you this question as we get going here tonight. Are you a leader who doesn't like change? Just chew on that for a second. Do you enjoy taking a risk as a leader to advance your company and your team to go further and further? Today, my guest is going to share some insights on how to seize opportunities that come from tension. I'm talking about tension that often happens in these change situations and how you navigate them, how do you leverage them, how do you go, go forward and succeed, get ready. For a very challenging and fun conversation here tonight. Janet M. Harvey inspires company leaders and to seize opportunities that arise from challenging situations and sustain excellence at a very high level. She's a person who transforms what many perceive as negative traits and circumstances into positive opportunities to fulfill your greatest needs. Janet is a CEO, award-winning author, speaker, thought leader, and professional coach. Well, that's well can Janet M. Harvey to the stage. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Richard, and thank your sponsors. Oh, my gosh, I wrote down all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're all here. They help make this better and better, and they all help us in different ways. It's so great to have them along. So you are a person that, dare I say, loves to challenge people. <laughs> I like my middle name. <laughs> what does the m stand for do we dare ask you uh it's manchester there we go uh and i married another brit a harvey <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't fit on letterhead very easy does it no it does not it does not yeah so you are a coach a speaker and you speak on this idea of change but you also have a company that's called Invite Change. So hear all about change. Tell me about Invite Change. How did you even come up with that name? When I uh, left corporate life and began being an entrepreneur, uh, the first company was Manchester Consulting Group because I wasn't very creative. <laughs> it was just a thing I was doing. And I got so busy that I finally decided maybe I ought to do something a little more structured. So I built a company called Clarity International because challenging is about producing clarity. Sounded good enough to me and off we <laughs> went. And well, uh, about eight years into that experience, I found myself on airplanes uh, six out of seven days a week. And one day I said, I don't think I'm very happy. I don't like this anymore. <laughs> I love the work I'm doing with the customers. I don't love the way I've structured the company. Yeah. So my partners bought me out. Awesome. I took a year off. And in that year, I did some traveling and my husband and I relocated from the East Coast to the West Coast. And, and I thought long and hard about what's the thing that's been common in my life from the very beginning. And it was change. And I realized that I love change. I love the grand adventure of life. And I thought, what if maybe that's what my coaching is all about, that I'm, I'm providing a place for people to learn to invite into their lives, change that will be more fulfilling, more satisfying, help them get to their, their big destination, the thing they're longing for, the aspirational dream in their lives. And uh, it's both a call to action and it's a full sentence. And it happens to be the name of our company. <laughs> I love that. And invite change. Now, that takes me to my leadership. I, I, I speak on leadership as well sometimes, but one of the things I talk about is, and I firmly believe this, one of the teachings is that leaders either learn to change, adapt, or die. Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> I think that they already know how to change. So 
what we are doing is unlayering all the things that say, keep it the same, repeatable, consistent, the status quo. And unfortunately, the environment around them doesn't stay static. So rather than learning to change, it's about remembering we know how to change and to do it deliberately on our terms with all the capability we develop as leaders. So you write about that in, in your book, Change, Lessons from 2021. But you ask a question in this, when is the last time you boldly changed the status quo? You actually put it in the book saying, check yourself. When was the last time you intentionally did it? How do people respond to that? <laughs> um, the third time I had a CEO call me and say, my team comes to me and says, you make their head hurt. <laughs> I finally decided I better pay attention to this and figure out how do I answer this question? Because the first time I laughed and the second time I went, huh, what meaning did you make of that as a good coach, right? I asked a question back. <laughs> and the third time I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to interview your team and find out why they think I make their head hurt. And it has to do with this question you're asking. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the, one of the possibilities that is in front of us as the complexity and uncertainty of the business environment continues to grow is for leaders to realize that the identity that they built encouraged from school to first job to every step on their career path, be smarter than anybody else, be well prepared, learn to be proactive, be an expert in your work, be right, doesn't leave any room for change. Yeah. It actually inhibits change. What's on the top 10 list for CEOs? Every year for the now 35 years I've been in professional life, innovation and creativity, <laughs> learning somewhere usually in the 10 as well. Yeah because we've built a system for repeatability, not for innovation. And we see those as either or, rather than recognizing they are like the two strands of DNA. And when we can hold both, now change becomes natural as part of the flow. So when, when, when you get into this with your public speaking and coaching, mm -hmm. you're poking the bear of tension. You're intentionally <laughs> saying, we've got to talk about the thing we don't want to talk about the tension of change and admitting you've got to accept this, right? You, you're intentionally saying we have to talk about this. How do they respond? Right. You know, one of the things that's so important in any coaching relationship, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many with a team is building the trust for vulnerability. And, you know, a couple of great thinkers out there, Amy Edmondson and Tim Clark are writing about psychological safety. That's a familiar concept, I would imagine. The challenge is that's rearview mirror. Like it's not safe to say, I don't know. It's not safe to push on the CEO's favorite projects and say, we're going down the wrong road, right? It's not safe to do that. So we don't. That's the culture now um, inhibiting the organization. As a CFO once said to me, you cannot cost cut your way to growth. It doesn't work. <laughs> I and love that. Another example of that, right? So, you know, I, I think what, what we get stuck on sometimes is how people perceive us as a priority over what does our authentic self recognize? How do we use our expertise to paint a new picture as opposed to getting stuck behind our expertise as this is the swim lane I'm in? Human beings are so much more than the thing we can acquire. And that's what we mean by maximized potential, right? We're tapping into the part of the self that somehow we, we sidelined. We, we parked them on the bench when we went out to play our sport, right? Yes. And it's like, no, 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 off the bench, back in the game. Let's bring the whole self in here now. Same thing, two strands of the DNA, our left brain, um, rational, concrete, sequential self, and our right brain creative, intuitive, instinctive selves are a far better partnership for producing results. Years ago, I had a consultant come in with a different organization I was running and with, with my leadership team for a weekend retreat. <laughs> and they are doing some of the things you're talking about. And But we also took the personality test to find out how we all play together. Well, me and one other of my leaders both came out mathematically identical, same keywords, same everything. And when they did the big reveal, they said, this is going to work gloriously 
or painfully <laughs> because the two of you are going to fill the same vacuum and there can only be one person to make the final decision when you face those challenges. Mm -hmm. Three and a half years later, that tension bubbled over. Yeah. Why do leaders not recognize? It's great to have like-minded people, but you do need differences on your team. You need a variety pack. Otherwise, you will collide like that, won't you? The tension will bubble up. Oh, boy. Now you've unpacked a big Pandora's box. <laughs> Uh, That's what I, I do for a living. <laughs> and I have a couple points of view. You're not surprised, right? <laughs> um, first of all, your personality is construction. You learned to behave in your life in a way that worked. You got rewarded for it from very young all the way through to wherever you are. When you take this test and it says, this is your personality. But I'm here to tell you, Rich, it is not who you are. It's just one thing you've constructed. There's so much more than that. Okay. Yep. So even though the two of you had the same data, you we are not, not the same. same found out. <laughs> <laughs> you are not the same people. So there's way more diversity by definition in every single team than an assessment report will ever show. Mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in understanding what motivates each leader on the team to express themselves the way they do? How is the system influencing them? How is their culture influencing them? How is their um, uh, life journey? Did you live in lots of different places in the world or have you never left Des Moines, Iowa? <laughs> that influences the belief system. It also embeds certain patterns habit, preference, assumption, and bias operating unconsciously because that's what our brain likes to do. We like the, the ease of habit. It's energy conservation. But again, as we were talking about a little earlier, everything around us is changing. So if I'm caught in habit, I'm going to be less productive and more and more and more less productive as time goes on. If I don't wake up and recognize, oh, I'm feeling a little bit of tension here. I wonder what the heck that is. And then here's the thing. How many years have we heard conflict management? Yes. Which I hate that term, by the way. Personally, <laughs> I hate that term. <laughs> and what's evoking the hate? Because I, probably me like you, I enjoy at some level the fact we do need to wrestle. To get to the next level, you do have to wrestle, even with your own team, to get to where you really want to get to. Yeah. So... When we harness that wrestling, because it tells us something is asking to be changed, now it's an adventure, right? N now everybody can bring their creative juices to it. Unfortunately, we have trained a whole lot of leaders to believe that they need to keep things on the even keel, right? Not too much variability from the water level. We don't want any big waves. It's too hard to manage predictability in our results. And in the process, we have snuffed out the smaller voices that have a creative idea. And we've given great energy to the ones who say, nothing's going to change. So, you know, we're underperforming to potential in all organizations because we've decided that predictability and consistency is king. So the shift is when tension shows up, what's the truth of the tension? What's the evidence that suggests that the way we've always done it is no longer producing as satisfying a result? It doesn't have to be complete breakdown and failure. Yes, of course, we have those things that we're navigating. But if we can pay attention to the moment when we feel tension, ah, it holds the seed of innovation. And if we can get curious, then that seed gets sprouted. And then the organization knows what to do with it. But it's the avoidance of the tension that keeps them from optimizing. So, so now you're setting me up. <laughs> now you're getting me going. <laughs> so I think today we have a lack of strong leaders. I don't think we have the leaders that you're describing. I don't think we have the people that are willing to knock on the door of danger, of risk, of let's go mix things up. Let's shoot for the back fence and swing big. I think we do have what you were describing, the, the stable, the predictable leaders. How much that lack of risk-taking leaders is hurting us right now across the world, across the globe, here in America. 
why don't we have those visionary risk takers leading the way you're describing? Mm -hmm. Why don't we? <laughs> you have so so like have we really been put into a box that much? Have have we been trained that much, schooled that much that we've lost the sense of follow me, let's take the hill? Okay. When's the last time you listened to an analyst call for a public company? It's been a while. <laughs> okay. Put it in your memory bank. Mm -hmm. You know that the questions are will you meet the earnings forecasts? Yep. What are you doing to manage risk? Here are three things going on in your industry that we think are going to put you in trouble. What are you doing about them? Mm -hmm. Right? So we've just said you will be rewarded on your ability to deliver on your promise. Even when the unexpected shows up and you better have a good answer for us. Mm -hmm. And then the unexpected happens that even the reporters didn't come up with and a curveball comes in called COVID. Or a curveball comes in like pirates in the Suez Canal and that blows up the supply chain, mm -hmm. right? We could go on and on. Cascading crises in the world. Leaders have never been trained to be agile, generative, regenerative, any of those fancy terms. They've been trained to be consistent, reliable, trustworthy, and they they cause their organizations a lot of pain in the process because if you're off plan, everything else stops. Everything you're investing in strategically to move the organization, to meet the market, all of these things I'm talking about that feel so aspirational come to a screeching halt. And we cut staff, right? Big reduction in force going on in tech right now. Yes. You know, come on, folks. It is the future. You're going to need that workforce. But they have to do it because they're rewarded in the stock market by meeting forecast. It's a short term view in a long term business and it's creating the ups and downs way bigger. They're not getting this. It's the irony. So let me go. Let me take that further. Because I do a keynote called the four good risk of leadership ah. and the Usually when, when I begin, I, I start talking about the negative ones that we all talk about, what you were just describing, the budget, the money, the time, the talent. And then I say, but there are four good risks. There's a gasp in the audience. There's good risk and leadership. <laughs> Love we that. don't know that there's good risk and leadership. We, do. We, we don't know anymore that you're supposed to pioneer. You're supposed to get out in front of this and lead, right? That's why you're appointed as a leader. That's right. So do you think there are good risk of leadership that we yes. need to know about? Yes, 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 yes. I'm totally with you. And here's the challenge. As long as it's somebody giving us a prescription outside of who we are, these are the four good risks you should follow. We take it in here, but our body doesn't respond. So I believe every single human being is a leader of themselves. They know an awful lot about leading but they get themselves into an environment and they give up on themselves and they look outside themselves what they're going to mimic. So not only have we trained it, but we've also set up the system. We've rigged the system, dress like me, look like me, sound like me, present like me, report like me. And what do people learn? They learn influence, subtle, finesse, relationship building. Now, mind you, all of those things are great skills, but what's the motive? Yes. And if we can't connect to a motive in here that matters to us, we will start to do the four things that get in the way of the four good risks. <laughs> Gossiping, criticism, yep. complaining is a similar, lying by omission, the small lies that are about being polite and kind instead of being direct and telling the truth. Yep. And then being judgmental, not accepting responsibility for what's going on in the situation, but pointing the finger out at somebody else and not ever getting curious enough to find out what do they know that I don't know, right? So this coming back home to self, recognizing my full capacity beyond my personality, uh, learning self-trust to express all of our ability, right and left brain, this is what's missing right now. So good risk, you bet. And I got to be able to move to it from all of my being, not just my brain. I won't do it. So too strong. 
there, there are those of us, and I'll, I'll put me in this camp right now, that we want to move fast. And sometimes you need to move fast. Sometimes you don't need to move fast. But I'm a person that's like, if I can see the vision, if I can see it, I have to lead that direction. But I sometimes lead too hard, too fast. They can go with me, but my speed of movement is not where they're at. Can you help us with that a little bit? How can we make good decisions as leaders and not leave them four miles behind us? Yeah, it's an excellent point. And it has to do with the objective. If the first objective is to see the aspirational dream on the horizon and cast a compelling vision, right? Senior leaders are very good at that. It's the only way they get to be a senior leader is that they can tell a really good story of a big enough dream that we all want to go to it. And then the role changes. To be a really good change leader, you have to stay on message and you have to stay curious. So instead of telling the story, now the leader becomes a listener. What action are you compelled to take from the talk we just had about the vision of the future? 30 days later, what's lingering with you that excites you about the future that we've been talking about? What are you moving with this in your team? What are you noticing with them is activating their excitement and energy? Where do you see it landing a little flat? We ought to be energizing it a little bit more. So the the role of the CEO is as change leader to listen deeply into the organization and keep feeding it. It's not to go on to the next new strategy. (laughs) Yes, you got to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. But I think that there aren't enough people who realize that you have to build awareness and desire before you can get to the operationalized side of that change process. And too many senior leaders set the bag down. Wow. As in the tool bag. <laughs> no, that, that, that is so, so good because asking the questions, keeping the conversation, they want to feel included in the, the adventure. That's right. And often sometimes visionary leaders, we go after the vision and assume they're in the boat with us and they've already got it. But we are three miles down the road and we do have to remember, wait, I have to go back and bring them with me. And that's a challenge of visionary leaders. That's a challenge for people that do want to lead. And I think you're right. Some people have gotten caught up in that. And instead of leading with vision now, they're afraid to speak any vision right. because they've lost their team before. So now they just don't come out and say anything, do they? Right. Other than to complain that their team doesn't take enough initiative. <laughs> so here's an interesting thing that I read about you. You claim, state, that you can boast and boost up help leaders with decision-making and their competency of decision-making up to 30% and help create a confident leader. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? What's the secret sauce of doing that? Uh, so the big word is reflection. And when you hear that word, Richard, what does that mean to you behaviorally? For me, it's stop, describe pause. It. Yeah. yeah, stop and pause and literally let it mull around my brain for me, put it on a whiteboard, look at the words, listen to it and bring it to life and then shut up. <laughs> okay. What are you bringing to life? I'm trying to bring the life for me personally. I'm trying to bring a life, the actual questions, thoughts, feelings of those that I've got in that leadership circle to bring this to reality. Mm-hmm. So notice the attention goes to how do I move the action? You're reflecting to come up with the next idea to move the action. (laughs) Yeah, very common. But here's the piece of the formula that gets missed. When we have a result we don't like, didn't meet the mark, didn't meet expectations, maybe even it had an unintended consequence. We're like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? Reflection is the act of replaying the story. We're looking for very specific things. What were the actions that created the result? Most leaders do a pretty good job on that after action reviews is the label we give that process. The steps they miss are what I call aware uh, alignment, clarity, and awareness. What was the basis of the decision? Was it a policy? Was it a long-standing set of metrics? 
Was it some financials that hadn't been vetted? What was it? What was the basis that chose those actions that produced that undesirable result? Okay. What is the motivation to choose that basis? Was it a belief? Was it a policy? Was it tradition? Was it the culture? Was it the sacred cow that nobody wanted to slaughter? Like, what the heck? What were people actually thinking when they decided on that to choose those actions that created the wrong result? And by then, they're already starting to realize we knew this before we started and we dismissed and disregarded some of the data that we were aware of. Okay, that's the first step of reflection. Mm -hmm. The second is the one that you're pointing to, but with a different motivation. Instead of to see new action, mm -hmm. if you can pause just a little bit longer, not weeks, months, years, I'm not talking about that. This could be, this could be done in 10 or 15 minutes and I do it in coaching sessions. What was the habit I had as a leader to listen to those two people and not triangulate the information? What's the preference I have for pace, resource, customers to test it with, vendors to use? What assumptions did I make when I heard the plan presented? And it kept me from seeing what I now see we dismissed. And therefore, what is the bias in the system that's operating, that's my job to remove? And if I don't do that level of thinking, I'm just gonna repeat history. I might learn from my after action review done a little more elegantly in the way I just described it, but I'm not actually gonna construct something brand new, which is step three. What do we change and what we become aware of? What are the beliefs that we want to adopt that motivate a richer, more collaborative, more diverse, inclusive process? And what do we need to have in our decision-making process to align to, to make sure that we don't have unintended consequences? When they do that, they have a much bigger group of options to consider, of actions to take, and eyes wide open as the results are starting to happen so they can be adaptive and then in some cases be proactive before they implement a problem because they've seen the whole picture. Yeah. Well, and as a visionary leader, I'm interested on in your perspective because I've illustrated this, talked about this many times that usually you look through binoculars and you have the small holes here and the big holes are out there. <laughs> As a visionary leader, I start at the other end. I already see the end. I already see the picture. I can taste, feel, touch it. It's the stuff in between I don't see. That's right. I can lead to the finish line because I know what it's going to look like. And one of the other people that coached <laughs> me at one point said, you're, you, you're, you're like Brett Favre, the great quarterback. You believe every pass is a touchdown. And everyone in the room is nodding their head. <laughs> and that's why you follow him. <laughs> But he doesn't understand that you see the in-between, John. And they all go, no. <laughs> How tough is that for some leaders? Because they do want to lead. They do feel the confidence. How hard is it for them to realize they need their team to help fill in the gap? Yeah, it's hard. I, I will agree. It is hard. And the reason is they've, they've never been challenged to not be the one with the answer. You know, in your example, I'm thinking about, um, I love high-speed driving. Um, used to have a 911 Targa, and I, my husband and I would go to the racetrack so I could go play. And the first thing I learned was always have your eye on the furthest point on the horizon because your brain sees everything in between. Yes. But here's the key. I still have to hold on to all of my skill to feel my, my butt in the seat. To, to feel where the wind is taking the car, mm -hmm. what's coming up on the turn, how much can I push into the turn and then allow the car to make the sweep of the turn. These are all little micro adjustments in the moment of the experience. I haven't left my eye on the horizon, but I'm doing all of the things necessary to meet what's right in front of me because that skill is in me. Most leaders don't spend time investing in the skills of the moment, moment to moment to moment to moment. Every conversation is an opportunity to help people recognize they're on track or off track. And that's a leader's job. They don't give feedback. How many leaders say to me, 
why do my people keep asking me for feedback? <laughs> and I said, well, it might be because you're not telling them if they're succeeding or not. Mm. Well, what do you mean? We made earnings. Mm -hmm. Earnings does not make. Richard, you did a fabulous job presenting last week. The data was crisp and clear. You engaged the audience and they left there on fire. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't do that. Nobody deserves that. I said, really? Did you deserve it on your way up the ladder? <laughs> so we touched briefly on pandemic, but I do want to pandemic cause everybody. Whether you're a leader, not a leader, everyone had to change, adjust, mm -hmm. make stuff up, try something new, reinvent themselves. It was a constant change. Come out pandemic, and then we have some financial crisis, potential, you know, big financial global crisis, and we're changing again. Part of my mission this year is I'm helping leaders, speakers learn confidence again because they've lost confidence. Mm -hmm. Hmm. On, on microphone, on camera, but even as leaders, they've just lost confidence because COVID, everything, they're exhausted. And then they had to reinvent themselves again after that. And now we had the hospital recession. They have to reinvent themselves and worry about that. Is this part of the problem of bold leadership, confident leadership that we need to help refuel them, reinvigorate them? How do, they, how do we not get zapped again and lose the confidence when – the world's changing so fast right now. Yeah. I think it's a profound question you're asking. And it has a lot to do in my mind with what responsibility does each person accept for following an inner authority? So many people give over their power to the boss, the team, the organization, sometimes to their family, to their community, to their commitments in their lives. And they wake up in the morning and go, I just can't do it one more time. Right? I'm exhausted. And the formula isn't about changing it out there. It's about changing it in here. Do I even know, consciously know, how I make decisions? Yeah. Have I ever looked in the mirror and said, you know what? Those people I hang out with in this book club group, it's not floating my boat anymore. We're not reading books I like. I find myself not having anything interesting to say when we come together. I'm either going to make a decision to juice it, right? figure out how to uplift the quality of it, or I'm going to say this season is done. Thank you. It's been awesome and move. We've forgotten that we're never without choice. I know, mm. double negative. We always have the power of choice. And it's important to learn to make those choices from here, not from out there. And this is the piece that we got caught in with the enormity of the impact of COVID and the fact, frankly, let me test this hypothesis with you, Richard. Bring it on. I believe I was here in 1973 when Netscape gave us the internet. Yeah. And the transformation has been nothing short of miraculous. Yes. We are seeing the same thing happen now with chat GPT and generative AI and all of the things that are gonna be possible there. This thing you and I are doing right now will be out on the web and in 72 hours to everybody in the world. The human body was not meant to absorb 8 billion people simultaneously <laughs> giving us information. We're just not wired for it. We don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So unless I can accept responsibility to putting some boundaries in place, deliberately choosing what I'm going to give my attention to, where mm -hmm. I'm going to put my curiosity and my learning, where I'm going to bring my love and empathy and build relationship, we must do that for ourselves. And that's not how society raised us. So it is profound, the response necessary for us to live in this modern age. It's different. Yeah. Boundaries for Leaders is a great book. Uh, I highly endorse it. And you need to read it and read it and read it. I am curious. You work on the global stage. You've been the global board of directors for the International Coach Federation. Mm -hmm. When it comes to leadership, how much of a difference is there in this problem that we're discussing there of confident leadership? Is this just an American thing or is this a global situation right global. now that we are experiencing? It's global. 
You know, I, I watched a wonderful panel coming out of Davos uh, that the Financial Times sponsored. Uh, they had uh, three corporate leaders and then a practice leader for um, Accenture on generative AI and what are your companies doing and how are you deploying it in your business? And, uh, you know, to a person, they said, we must, as leaders, fully endorse expansion of roles not replacement of roles. Say that again. Say, just, just, please, just say that again. We as leaders must fully embody the expansion of roles, not the replacement of roles. And they all held AI as augmented intelligence. I've been talking about it as embodied partnership. And I watch our marketing team. They're using ChatGPT to write so much faster, so much cleaner, and they're having more fun because they're getting to use their creativity with the art of the prompt, right? I mean, it's just amazing. And when leaders look at this as a PL move, as opposed to we're fundamentally transforming the rhythm and the system, how do we then up level how all of us participate in that system? that's the challenge of leadership in this modern age and i think that uh we need more brave leaders like i heard uh, it was l'oreal and dhl and uh, alliance insurance wow yeah pretty special <laughs> do you believe we're almost done with our time did you, did you believe how fast this has gone today this has been marvelous but we okay. do want to let them know you do have a website, you do have material, you are a coach, you are a global expert. Tell us what they're going to find on your website, if you would. The Janet M. Harvey site is where you can come and learn a little bit more about me, uh, both of the books that I've written and also the subjects that I speak about as a keynote uh, speaker. I love going into companies and giving leaders an opportunity to do reflection, as we were doing here in our session, and to help them to start to see it's actually really good inside of you, right? Uh, I believe actually that when we come back home to self, life gets a whole lot easier. And I'm very interested in shaping a world where people love their life's work, not dread and feel like it's toxic. So that's what you'll find there. And of course, um, my work in Invite Change is all about uh, generative coaching and leader development. So one final question, and I, and I saved this for last I might be opening up a whole other can of worms. I may have to get you back again here. Oh, that would be so sad. <laughs> because, because this was so boring for the two of us. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you talk about helping leaders gain confidence, and we desperately need that today. Is there a false confidence that people are leaning on right now? They're exuding confidence, saying confidence, looking cool confidence, but we all know you're just as lost as the rest of us? And is that part of the problem that we need to get rid of the false confidence and be, dare I say, more authentic with where we're at as leaders? <laughs> I, I want to go in a slightly different doorway. I don't disagree with your premise, but I think the solution rests more in coming to peace with not knowing. Mm. We can normalize being able to say, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. And I'm really curious what's causing the question to surface for you. What are you seeing? What are you looking at? This is what you and I have been doing throughout this entire conversation. Neither one of us knows the whole answer, but if we're willing to stand in that and go, oh, that's a state of wonder, right? Wrapped attention to something astonishing emergent. That's wonder. And I believe you have to say, I don't know, before you can have wonder. And that's the answer I would give you. Wonderful way to drop the mic, end it for this time session, because I know we need to come back. I know we're going to have emails and follow-ups. Uh, Janet M. Harvey, this has been a pleasure to have you with us here today. Again, what's the best way to email you, contact? What's the best way to find you? Yeah, Janet at JanetMHarvey.com. Janet M. Harvey, don't forget the name. Thanks for being with us here today on Rock the Stage. Thank you, Richard. It's a joy. Wow. We really could have gone a lot, a lot longer. We are just, I, I'm excited because this is part of my other love of helping leaders grow in confidence. And wow, 
you really want to reach out and connect with Janet and make sure you do so. And again, this is all made possible with our wonderful sponsors like Adavita Studios. Adavita will take your podcast, your audio books, produce it, and help it go out to the market faster, cleaner, and help you get your voice out to the market. And also we have Suspiciously Convenient Productions is also with us as one of our sponsors. They'll take your book, maybe your movie script, maybe you're an aspiring author that wants to have something done. Contact them and they will help that all come to light. And of course, Plexiglam is helping us. Plexiglam is helping us do this so we can read the script, stay focused, connect with people through the magic of what they produce. Hey, thanks for being with us here tonight. We are so thrilled that you're here with us on a PPN now. And we're going to continue the stream on YouTube, PPN. Join us Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Remember to write, ask questions, tell us the, the topics you want to be involved with, the amazing guests that we have each and every week. Contact me, Rich, at richbontrager.net. Until next Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, have a safe week and keep shining bright. We'll see you then back here once again for another edition of Rock the State Show.